I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Epigenetics and Stem Cell Aging Unit at the NIA, and I'm about to talk to you about this. So I'm referring to the title. How does one even get to that title? So first, we, we start for a very general and a very short, simple question. Can we extend lifespan? We know we can. We have caloric restriction and rapamycin, so we need to get a little bit more specific. Can we do it with cyclic partial reprogramming or CPR in mice? Yes, we can, but we can do it in premature aging models. So we need to refine the question again and ask, can we do it in non progeric mice? The answer here is maybe. And when we include health span, we don't know, actually. These studies have not been done. So when you rearrange the words a little bit, you do get the question that my uh, title is actually answering to. So this is how you get to that very specific dial. Just a crash course on partial reprogramming. Everybody knows the epigenetic landscape. It's a space where every cell is in between a pluripotent and terminally differentiated cell. And reprogramming is the process through which a terminally differentiated cell goes through uh, a process of reprogramming back to pluripotency using OSKM or Yamanaka factors. Uh, partial reprogramming can be conceptualized in a similar way. Uh, so if you add one additional axis, so we would have to imagine it extending from the screen towards us in the audience, uh, this would be the aging axis. And partial reprogramming would be composed of two different components, and those would be rejuvenation and de-differentiation. So rejuvenation for the purposes of this talk will be defined as resetting epigenetic patterns and the DNA methylation clock, as well as restoring youthful gene expression patterns. So if we come back to the original slide and we overlay those axes, if we imagine that the cell at the bottom right uh, comes towards us, that would be a partial, partially reprogrammed cell which retained its cell identity, so it did not de-differentiate, it just got rejuvenated. In theory, can this affect lifespan? Well, we think it can because we're affecting the epigenome. We're going from the bottom up and we assume that it would propagate all the way from the transcriptome, proteome, all the way to the phenome. Uh, in practice, uh, there are instances of uh, social insects where there are individuals who are genetically identical but have various lifespans on the orders of magnitude. And there's evidence that this is happening to an epigenetic mechanism. So yes, but social insects are not mammals. So how do you actually partially reprogram? Uh, reprogramming can be done temporally in three different ways. You can do it continuously, uh, you can do it transient, so one-off, or you can do it cyclically, so on and off. Now, I keep harping on several words which you'll hear a lot, and those are non-progeric, early onset, cyclic, and I snuck one in, robust. Uh, so why are these important? Um, they're important because there's only three studies that have explored partial reprogramming and its effect on lifespan, which is quite weird for an intervention that's supposed to be so amazing. Uh, one of these studies is the landmark Ocampo 2016 paper, where they've shown in progeric mice, uh, if you expose these animals to a cyclic protocol of dox doxycycline on for two days and off for five days, uh, you get an increase in median and maximum lifespan. Great. Uh, in 2022, there was a study in non progeric mice where there was no difference in median or maximum lifespan after a transient induction, but they did find an increase in the third quartile. And lastly, this year, there was a study uh, which was a late onset study at 124 weeks of age where non progeric mice were treated with a cyclic protocol as well, and there was an increase in the remaining lifespan. This is not lifespan uh, as defined as median lifespan. So, of course, the Captain Obvious idea is, why well, just not use the Ocampo idea from 2016 with cyclic reprogramming and do it on non progeric mice? So before I answer that, uh, let me show you a couple of papers that have tried doing that or a version of that. Um, so these are not lifespan studies, but they did assess various tissues here. And what was found is that after either a cyclic protocol of two days on, five days off, or a transient uh, protocol, you have rejuvenation in several tissues, but no rejuvenation in some other tissues. Uh, there are many reasons why this could happen. Uh, one of them could be maybe the onset of the intervention is not early enough, or the intervention itself is not strong enough to elicit effects in the non-progeric mice. So this is a table of everything that's been done so far. These are all great studies, but you can see that uh, none of these studies has all the check marks of doing a chronic, cyclic, early onset lifespan study that's done in non progeric mice. So, this is where uh, this study comes in, and this is what we are doing. 
So what's the issue with early onset robust CPR? That should be easy, right? Well, that's the elephant in the room. Uh, if you expose the animals to reprogramming factors for long enough, they actually die. Uh, and that's, this is linked to hepatic and intestinal failure, uh, which is obviously not great if you want to extend life. Um, so coming back to the original slide, um, continuous, it's out of the question. Uh, transient and cyclic does work in progeric mice, but has mixed effects in non-progeric mice. So what happens if you do it cyclically, but robustly? So if you change the 2.5 uh, protocol to something more uh, strong. So we have no life mice. This is a model that enables us to do just that. Uh, it's a quadruple transgenic mouse strain uh, originating from the Ocampo lab. Uh, no life stands for no liver intestine four factor expression. Uh, essentially what it does, it's uh, the, the polycystronic cassette containing OSKM is floxed and Cree recombinase is under the uh, villain and albumin promoters. So it's being excised in the liver and intestine, which allows us to safely and long-term uh, induce the rape programming in the entire body and avoiding uh, intestine and the liver. So this is the experimental design. I'll come to the data in just a minute. Uh, it's called Croatia. It's uh, cyclic reprogramming of animals testing in aging. We have a longitudinal and a cross-sectional arm, and I'll show you the data from the longitudinal arm. Uh, essentially, at four months, we have a baseline assessment uh, of various things, behaviorally, cognitively, body composition, blood, uh, cardiology, and so on. I'll get to that. Uh, we do a baseline, and then after that, we expose these animals for a lifelong, uh, robust, cyclic protocol. Uh, and every three to six months, we repeat these measures. Uh, and we call this longitudinal deep phenotyping uh, to see how these animals change. We also have a cross-sectional uh, arm that I mentioned. This will be used to collect the tissues at various time points and detect the molecular changes that accompany this. So there's a lot of questions this study will answer. Uh, to keep it short, uh, it will help us answer, does it actually extend lifespan? And if it does or doesn't, we'll know the molecular me mechanisms behind that. So how I hope you remember this talk is that Croatian guy giving CPR to no life mice. That sh should be easy. <laughs> now, uh, a speed run through the data, a uh, couple of caveats. It's just six, month in, six months in uh, cohort one, uh, preliminary data, but still. So body weight. Uh, if you look at the top left, we can see that the body weight in the dogs treated animals, so these are the reprogrammed ones and the vehicle ones, uh, it's almost the same trend. Uh, if you look at the NMR results, so those are the three graphs uh, on the right, uh, they gain weight in exactly the same compartment, namely fat. Uh, why I'm emphasizing these results is what has, has been found in reprogramming is that if animals were to die, one of the first things that happen is they lose weight. So the fact that they are gaining weight at the same rate and the same compartment as vehicle mice is pretty great. We checked for frailty with a frailty index. We found no differences here, which is expected because these animals are now 10 months old, um, which is roughly 35 years old in people, so we don't even expect them to be frail. Differences that we did found was in surface temperature. So these reprogrammed mice do run cooler than vehicle controls. Uh, we have some hypo hypotheses why this happens, and we're looking into that. Now we're coming to the hematological system. Um, and we, we chose to look at this system because it has some very dramatic uh, age-associated phenotypes, which are typical for mice. Two of these phenotypes, which are usually seen with age, are an increase in white blood cells and an increase in platelets. Uh, you can see that evidently in the white bars in our vehicle controls. It's being increased over time. In our reprogrammed mice, the trajectory is similar. It's going in the same direction, uh, but there is no statistical significance, so it's attenuated. This is not happening in our no-life mice to the same degree. Um, about, about the uh, composition of the blood, uh, we also found that CPR induced uh, myeloid bias. So if you look at the 10-month time point with DOCs, so these are the reprogrammed mice, in the red you can see the myeloid cells. So this is something that's usually not great in aging research because uh, as animals age, they go, uh, the HSCs are biased to produce more of a myeloid lineage. Uh, but luckily enough, I, I call this transient and temporary because at 13 months uh, it is reversed and uh, it is very similar to what the vehicles show. 
We looked at heart function as well. Uh, this was very interesting for us because uh, cardiomyocytes are terminal differentiated. There's a question of even if there's stem cells in the heart and so on. Uh, the first three graphs at the top show uh, left ventricular wall measures, which all increase in our reprogrammed mice, which is indicative of heart remodeling. Um, so this could either be a good sign or a bad sign. It could be hypertrophy or hyperfunction. And to know which one of those two it is, you have to correlate with all the other measures, which we did take, and I'm going to show a few of them in the bottom. Uh, so we looked at heart rate, for example. Heart rate drops in our vehicle controls while it is still maintained in our reprogrammed mice. The RR interval is just the inverse of heart rate, so same thing here. Cardiac output is a measure of cardiac function, and you can see there is a trend of an increase in our reprogrammable mice, while vehicle controls actually drop their cardiac output with time. Cardiac index is cardiac output divided by weight as a correction, and you can see there is a trend of a decrease in vehicle controls while reprogrammed mice maintain their cardiac index. Uh, long story short about the hearing, we tested it with the acoustic startle. Um, there were no differences after six months of reprogramming, so the mice are equally bad at hearing after uh, six months. We also checked grip strength and endurance. Uh, no statistically significant differences in grip strength, and if you look at cage top hang times, uh, there is a dramatic decrease from four months to 10 months, but this decrease is present in both groups, and there is no difference between the decrease itself, so no beneficial effects here. Uh, we also assessed motor function or balance uh, on the horizontal beam. Long story short, short no difference. Um, we checked open field, so this is one of the tests where we did find a dramatic difference. Uh, there is an age-associated phenotype uh, here as well, where aged animals just move less and you can see this evidenced in the uh, vehicle controls where they actually drop off significantly and uh, the no-life mice, the reprogrammed ones, uh, maintain their activity. And lastly, uh, this is the cross maze results uh, where we tested short-term memory. Uh, we looked at percentage of alternation. For anybody not familiar, alternation is when an animal is placed into the apparatus and just goes into four different arms of the apparatus without repeating one of the arms. Uh, we, this is an assumption that if the animal were to remember an arm, it would not go into it again. Um, so you can see there is a loss of short-term memory in vehicle controls, which is not apparent in uh, our reprogrammed mice. So to sum up, after six months of robust reprogramming, uh, we didn't find any negative health outcomes. Uh, it maintained activity levels and short-term memory, induced heart remodeling, uh, and attenuated some age-associated changes in the hematological compartment, and it didn't have effects on multiple things that I showed from body composition all the way to frailty and endurance. Currently, we're at 11 plus months of re robust reprogramming. We still have no mortality in this cohort. Uh, we, that's more than one and a half times more than the maximum reported in currently published studies, and we're currently analyzing serum for cytokines, clinical chemistry, urine, um, feces, and so on. So I'd like to thank everybody in the lab who helped with this, Dr. Ocampo for giving us the initial breeder pairs of mice, the mice themselves who are enduring this uh, very strong protocol. And yeah, if you see this, I'm probably out of time. <laughs>